Well, um, we're in the middle of a series called Free, and if some of you weren't here last week, so we're going to review real quick. And um, here's how we're going to review. I need for all of you who are watching online at all of our Atlanta area churches, even if you're watching on television or uh, you're at home by yourself, I want all of you who are ungodly, just, just the ungodly people, to raise your hand. Yeah, okay. Now, if this is your first time and you kind of pulled your purse a little bit closer and put your hand and make sure your wallet was still in there. It's because you weren't here last week. And here's what you get to do. If you go to this website right here, you can actually catch up on all of these messages. They're going to be up there during the entire series and after that. If you're in a small group, you can go to wecanbefree.org, download some questions, discuss it with your friends or your small group. And you don't even have to just sit at your computer and listen to these because you have 3G and 4G and 5G and all the G's, you know, and you can actually just play it in your car on your, your phone while you're driving along. You just can't watch. You just, just listen. But we want you to get caught up because we're talking about some of the most confusing, complicated stuff in the entire New Testament. And if you thought last week was confusing, you haven't seen anything yet. Today is going to be so confusing. But in church world, we don't say confusing. What do we say? We say it's deep. It's deep. <laughs> it's deep. But actually, it's just confusing, but it's extremely, extremely important. And so I'm here to take some of the most important, confusing texts in the New Testament and try to make it clear. But if you walk away from this message, especially if you brought a friend and you told him how good it was going to be, and at the end, they're, you're looking at each other like, oh, I don't even really know what he's talking about. You just remember I told you up front, this is, this is confusing, but it's important, but I'm going to try to simplify it for you. Now, we began last week with this. We said it's hard, it's very difficult to solve a problem when you don't know what's wrong to begin with. It's difficult to solve a problem when you don't know what's wrong to begin with. And some of us have been working on us for a long, long time and we don't seem to make much progress. And sometimes your wife or your husband or your parents look at you or your kids look at you and say, what's wrong with you? And, and you know there's something wrong, but you can't solve it because you don't know what's wrong. And the problem may be that you may not know what the problem is or the problem may be that you don't know what the problem may be. And so you have an idea of what the problem may be but you're, you've been working on it for so long and you've made such little progress in certain areas of your life. It might be, just, just work with me, it may be that you don't know what the problem may be. So last week we looked into the New Testament where the Apostle Paul, who sat under Matthew and Mark and who traveled around with Luke and he knew John and he knew the teachings of Jesus, where he took the teachings of Jesus and he talked about it in such a way to give us better insight into what's wrong with us and better than simply telling us what's wrong with us gives us a solution. So last week we looked at the problem for today, the next couple of Sundays, we're going to look at the solution. Now, again, if you're a Bible person or you're a Christian, you really need to lean in and take this seriously. This is so life changing. If you're not like a Bible person or you're not sure about the Bible, you're not a Christian, I want you to listen because here's what I know about you. You have something in common with all of us. And what you have in common with all of us is there are things in your life you can't change. And you've tried and you've tried and you've tried and you've spent a lot of money maybe trying to get them changed. And you've had lots of long conversations with people you love trying to get them changed. And sometimes you look in the mirror and you say, what's wrong with me? So I want you to listen carefully. And we're gonna begin the way we did last week by allowing the Apostle Paul, who's gonna give us all this information to describe how he experienced his problem. And I think here's a passage of scripture we can all identify with because at some point in our lives, we have been there, done that, and have a closet full of t-shirts. Here's how he described it. Remember this? I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Yeah, he goes on. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Yeah, he goes on. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin living in me that does it, okay? <laughs> now, Hey, you don't have to be a religious person to, to, to get that. How many times have you driven home late at night going, I did that again, what's wrong with me? Or you end up with a long conversation, difficult conversation with your husband or wife, and you know they're right, and you've defended your actions, but you know, when you sober up a little bit or when you have a little bit more time to think about it, you look in the mirror and you think, why do I keep on doozing this? Why do I keep on doing this? What is, what's wrong with me? What's gotten into me? We've all been there, and some of you are there right now, and some of you are transitioning from one can't stop doozing it to, to something else, and, and it's not, you know, you, you, 
You've tried all kinds of stuff. So last week, the Apostle Paul, we looked at a passage where he explained to us why we have such a difficult time training ourselves. We have an easier time, as we said, training our dogs than we do ourselves sometimes. I mean, our dogs have, my dog, I have two dogs, very few self-destructive behaviors, okay? They have almost no self-destructive behaviors. We have trained them out of all their self-destructive behaviors. Why is it that you do things that destroy your relationships, the way you view yourself, um, your, your finances, your, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. What, what is that? Now, you have a theory of what, as to what it is. Last week, we looked at what the Apostle Paul said that his theory was or what he believed it was. And here's what he said. He said that once upon a time, there was actually, he believed in history, a man named Adam. And the entire human race was in Adam because he was the first person. He was the first male. And he said, in not only a physical way, but even larger than a physical way, everybody was born into Adam. You were born in Adam, I was born in Adam, Billy Graham was born in Adam, Mother Teresa was born in Adam, all of our presidents and vice presidents were born in Adam. Everybody was born in Adam. And what was true of Adam is true of us. And through Adam, through Adam he said, sin, look at there, sin, <laughs> knock it this way better, sin entered the world. Now this is very important because the apostle Paul talked about, like we said last week, he talked about sin as if it were a noun. Now, this is going to be really important at the end of this message in the next couple, so you got to pay attention. He talked about that sin entered the world through Adam. We'll set sin right there next to Adam. And when Adam sinned, this is huge, when Adam sinned, it was as if all of us sinned. And we came into this world with the guilt of sin, the condemnation of sin, and the fact that sin rules over us. And Paul would say to you, if you have to leave early, here's the bottom line. He would say to you, the reason you keep doing things you don't want to do, the reason there's an internal battle inside of you is because sin lives in you and sin is your master. And at times it's as if you have no option but to obey the sin in you. Now, you may think that's too mystical and weird. That's okay, just kind of go with us. We're the crazy Christians who believe Jesus rose from the dead. And once you kind of settle that, all, you start believing all kinds of crazy things. But this is his explanation. This is his explanation as to why we do things we don't want to do because we were born in Adam. And in Adam, there was sin and condemnation and sin ruled over all of us, okay? Now, at the end of this, hey, been there, done that, we all get this. Listen to how the Apostle Paul ends this kind of, this sort of, you know, this tirade, this kind of rant, this big giant complaint. Here's what he says. This is awesome. What a wretched man I am. That's pretty bold. You know what that tells us? It tells us that this thing that he wished he didn't do, but he kept on doing, it wasn't something small. It wasn't, I keep driving five miles per hour over the speed limit. Oh, wretched man, no. Oh, I, my wife continues to have to remind me to clean out the dishwasher. I should do it without being reminded. Oh, wretched man, no, no, okay. <laughs> Whatever it was, and he doesn't tell us, I'm glad he doesn't tell us. Whatever it was, it just drove him to the point where I know what I ought to do and I just can't do it consistently. I have good days and I have two or three days where I'm kind of having victory over this thing or I'm consistent, but what is wrong with me? What's gotten into me? And as he said last week, it's sin that gotten into him, got, got into him. You know, wretched man that I am. And you know what? Some of you, 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 Christian or not, there are moments in all of our lives we felt that. What is wrong with me? I would do anything to change. I would do anything to break this habit. I would do anything to be able to not just blurt out all over my kids and all over my husband, all over my wife. I would do anything to rid myself of this incessant insecurity that drives me to do things that I regret later. Wretched man, wretched woman that I am. And then in the next verse, he asks a question. Here's a question. What will rescue me? And actually, that's not his question. That's our question. I'll tell you his question in a minute. This is the question we ask. What can I do? What can I change? What can I read? What, 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 what insight will save me? What new worldview will save me? What can I do? What can I do? What do I need to read? What do I need to know? What, 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 what? <laughs> and as you've already discovered, there's no what that will rescue you. There's no what that will save you, not even a sermon. 
not even a verse. It's not a what. And now the apostle Paul begins to introduce us to the solution of sin in us that controls our behavior, that leads us to the the point where maybe you don't use these words, but you felt, oh, wretched woman that I am, oh, wretched mother that I am, oh, wretched husband that I am, oh, wretched person that I am, oh, wretched man that I am. Here's his question, who? Who, not what? Who will rescue me? Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. And then he goes on. Thanks be to God who delivers me through. Oh, now this is a big word for the next few weeks. Who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know what? When you read the New Testament, if you've started reading the New Testament, especially the letters, you know, Peter wrote some letters and James wrote a letter and Paul wrote a bunch of letters. And throughout, you see these phrases like through Christ and through him and in me and all this stuff. And you read that and go, yeah, that must be some sort of like motivational thing. And and you keep on going. But Paul's about to tell us, no, it's, it's, it's way bigger than some sort of thing that, you know, the cheerleaders would write on the banner that the football team would run through. It's, it's a way bigger deal than that. There's something very significant about the whole idea of something through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the apostle Paul now introduces us to the solution. He says, the solution, the solution isn't a what? The solution isn't you. The solution isn't discipline. The solution isn't, you know, more willpower. Although in the New Testament, he encourages all of those things. In fact, one of the fruit of the spirit is the ability to have self-control. But he says, it's bigger than that. The answer for your why can't I do what I ought to do is a person. Thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ or Jesus Christ, our Lord. So for the next few minutes and for the next couple of weeks, we're gonna talk about how he describes how this who connects with the do. Because if I can get the who to connect with the do, maybe I won't do the things I don't want to do. And the apostle Paul tells us that's how he found victory over the things that controlled his life, that for so many years he tried to overcome on his own. So this is so complicated. I'm gonna go ahead and give you the bottom line before we look at the verses, just in case I lose you in the weeds. Then at the end, I'm gonna come back around and try to give you an illustration that pulls all this together. Basically, here's what he's gonna tell us. Just as the single unrighteous act of one man ensured you were born a slave to sin, pause, just as the single unrighteous act of one man, Adam, ensured that you were born a slave to sin, that when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, he introduced sin into the world, which meant everybody related to Adam is born under the power and the authority of sin. Just as one single unrighteous act of one man ensured that we were born slaves to sin, so the single righteous act of one man frees you from the power of sin. So the one single act, specifically the death of Christ on the cross, we'll explain it in just a second, has the potential that once you are taken out of Adam and placed into Christ, you then are free from the power of sin. To which you say, oh no, I'm not. To which I say, hey, we're just in week two, so hang on, okay? Because now the apostle Paul is gonna explain something to us that, that some of you are gonna have a hard time believing. In fact, you, you're gonna say, I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know. And the reason you're gonna say, I didn't know is because you didn't know. And in fact, he starts his discussion by saying, don't you know? Because even his audience didn't know. So are you ready? Here we go. This is gonna be Romans chapter six. If you're following along, you can turn there or thumb there, however you get to Romans chapter six. We're gonna begin in verse two. Complicated verses. They're so powerful. I think one of the reasons they're so complicated, I think Paul wasn't writing this. I think he was dictating it. You ever dictated something, but you can't erase and backspace and start over and paper was so valuable. So there would, there would be start and stops and oh yeah, I'm not sure. And did I make that clear? So I'm gonna to try to take you through these verses in a way that's clarifying because the truth, the truth, the truth of these verses is so extremely liberating and thus the name of this series, Free. Okay, so here we go. Put on your thinking caps. We are those who have died to sin. We, he's talking to Christians now, we are those who have died to sin. Then he asks a question. How can we live in it any longer? We've died to sin. How can we continue to live in it? (laughs) To which we all wanna raise our hand and say, well, I can explain that part. Okay, let me just tell you how to live in it. It's real simple. In fact, just follow me around. I'll show you how a Christian lives in sin. I do it every day. 
It takes no effort, no discipline. I don't have a little card on my mirror that says, remember to live in sin. I just kind of go there. And then I get to the end of my day and I say, dear heavenly father, please forgive me of all my sins. And I was taught in Sunday school that God forgives my sin or, and, or forgets it. Or maybe you run and talk to a priest and say, here's my sin load. And he goes, bless you. And then you're, the slate's wiped wipe clean. And the apostle Paul would say, wait, 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 wait. I'm not asking you, how do you do it? I know how you do it. I just told you, I used to do that. What I'm asking is this, why? Why? Why would those of you who've been freed from sin continue to live in it? Why do you keep doing that? Why would you keep treating her that way? Why, why would you live that lifestyle? Why would you treat your body that way? Why do you keep screaming at your kids? Why, he's asking, why would those of you who have been freed from the power of sin continue to live under the power of sin? Why would you quit saying, why would you keep saying yes to a master who's no longer your master, <laughs> to which we go, uh, uh, and then it dawns on Paul, or don't you know, or don't you know, or don't you know, to which we go, I don't think I knew. I, I, I thought I'm a sinner and I'm a bad person, or you know, I'm not as bad as some people, but I'm not as good as some people, so I just sin, I go, what do you expect? Nobody's perfect, then I ask God to forgive me my sin. I thought that was the whole deal, and Paul's going, didn't you know there's so much more to the fact that Christ died for your sin that you, then you get to go to heaven someday and you get forgiven in this life? Didn't you know to which we go, no, I, I don't think I knew. And now he tells us what we perhaps never knew. Ready, here we go. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Didn't you know that? And you're going, not only did I not know that, now that you've told me that, I still don't know it. What is that, okay? Now, hang on, this is so important. Here's what he's gonna do, all right? When we see the word baptize, we think water baptism or sprinkle, or we get in a big argument with the person next to us because we dunk and we sprinkle and na 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 na. He's not even talking about that, okay? This little word baptize, if you've been around here, you've heard us talk about it. It was, a, it was a common word. It had no religious connotation. It simply meant to place in, to dip, to immerse, you know, and, and we're fine if people are sprinkled. It's, that's not a big deal to us. But the word itself, the word itself translated baptize means to put something in something. Now, here's what he's saying, follow me. He's saying, don't you know, which they didn't know, we don't know. Don't you know that when we'll take Sandra here because she was on the top, because she's not quite as much a sinner as some of the rest of you. Don't you know, uh, I'm just trying to model good husbanding for you guys. Okay, hey darling, don't you know, ready? Don't you know that when you were baptized into Christ, that is placed into Christ, don't you know, don't you, there's my daughter, Allie, and this is my son's blue, okay? Don't you know, or maybe that's me, don't you know, follow me, follow me, don't lose. Don't you know that when you were baptized into Christ, that is taken out of Adam and placed into Christ, don't you know that you were baptized into his death? Now he's introducing something to us that's so important. Here's what he's introducing. Remember, he said this, when you were in Adam, what was true of Adam was true of you. You were separated from God and you were lost and you were, a, you were a prisoner to the power of sin. Sin was your master. Even though it wasn't fair, even though it's not your fault, it was real. It's not, your fa it's not fair to you that you were born with sin, but it's real. Remember, this is important. Just because something's not fair doesn't mean it's unreal. You see things in our world all the time that are not fair, but they are true. Something can be absolutely unfair and true at the same time. You were born condemned by God because you were related to Adam. It's not fair, it's true. Paul says, don't you know that when you put your faith in Christ, you were taken out of Adam and you were placed into Christ, and don't you know that in that moment, just as what was true of Adam was true of you, in the same way, what is true of Christ is now true of you? Which means that when he died, by being placed into Christ, it's as if you died. You say, well, I wasn't actually there. Well, you weren't actually here either. Don't you know that the death that he died, you were in Christ when he died. So the benefits and all the ramifications of his death are true of you? Did you not know that? You were baptized into his death? I didn't know that. He goes on. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, 
in order that, hang on, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. That the death of Christ and all that went along with it, he's gonna explain that in just a second, and the resurrection of Christ and all that went along with it are true of you because you are in Christ. Let me just say it. All the benefits, all the benefits of Christ's death and resurrection have been applied to us because we're in him. All the benefits of Christ's death and resurrection are true of us because we're in him. Now, if you've been a Christian for a long time or you grew up in church, you've already believed part of this because here's the part that, that, that you believe. Do you believe that somehow you were, because you were related to Jesus or asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin, um, you get to go to heaven when you die? Well, that's part of the message of the gospel, that you were taken out of Adam, taken out of condemnation and placed into Christ. But what you didn't know, this is why Paul is fleshing this out and he tries to go so slow and he tries to go down every avenue to make sure we don't miss anything, is that not only does that apply after we die, it applies in this life and that Christ's death on the cross and everything that went along with it is true of you because you are in Christ. He goes on, for we know that our old self, and here's some of the most, these are some of the most powerful, complicated verses in the entire New Testament. So hang on, ready? For we know, and he's going, they're going, we didn't know. He's going, well, you know now. So hang on. For we know that our old self, our old self, our old self, our old self, that like there's two selves. No, no, he's saying there's an old self and a new self. The old self was the you and Adam. We know that our old self, it's now in Christ, for we know that our old self was crucified with him. That once you're placed into Christ, what was true of Christ, including his crucifixion, is true of you. He says that you were crucified with Christ. I wasn't there, oh, oh, but see now you're in Christ. I'm in Christ. So what is true of Christ is true of you. He was actually crucified, you were in him. Paul says you were crucified with him. The reason you get to go to heaven is because you're in Christ. The reason you're able to live a new kind of life now is for the very same reason you are in Christ. Christ, we go slow. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin, that's the old part of us, might be done away with. Literally, here's what that means. It means that the part of you that has been ruled by sin is no longer under the power or the dictate of sin, to which we push back and go, okay, I don't think you know me very, very well. Paul's writing to people he had never met. You say, Andy, but I, and Paul would say, wait, wait, we're not, let's don't get specific. I just, I just want you to hear me out. I just want you to understand the significance of what happened. And you say, well, I, I didn't know that. I've never heard this. Paul's going, that's why I'm trying to explain it because nobody told you before. Let me read the whole verse again. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be, check it out, slaves to sin. Or another way of saying it is this, that we should no longer live as slaves to sin. That I should no longer say yes to sin because I'm not a slave of sin. You go, Andy, but sometimes the temptation is so strong and Paul would say, well, yeah, but you're not a slave of sin. Because when you were taken out of Adam and placed into Christ, sin at that moment lost its power over you. Okay, okay, hold on, hold on. He's not done. Because, because, because. Now, this is huge. Here's how we know that's true. Ready? Because, 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 because of the wonderful things he does. Ready? Here we go. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Have you ever tried to tempt a corpse? Okay, listen. Once you die, you will never be tempted to eat too much again or look too long. Okay, once you die, you are free from the power of sin. Now here's what he's saying. He's saying that when you were placed into Christ, everything about Christ's death was applied to you and does apply to you. And when you died in Christ, you died to the slave master of sin. He goes on and he just comes out and says it. The death, the death he died, he died to sin once for all, which means literally it happened once and for all, and it happened once, once for all. It happened once and for all, that it means it doesn't ever have to happen again. And literally it means it happened once 
for all. That is, it happened for you. That when Christ died to sin, you died to sin once you were placed in Christ. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Okay, you're going, oh, oh, I know, I know. That's why we're spending a few weeks on it. Now, at this point, he comes to the application, all right? So you're going, okay, let me, let me get this straight. Okay, I'm not sure I'm buying it, Andy. I'm not sure I'm buying it, but I just wanna make sure I'm understanding. In case I have to argue with you, I wanna make sure I've, I've heard. So you're saying, that some mystical, weird way, there was somebody Adam, named Adam, because physically, you know, we're all from Adam. You know, okay, I, I get that. I was born in Adam, Adam sinned, so the consequences of his sin were applied to me, so I was kind of born in sin. Not sure I like the way that sounds. Okay, I'm ungodly, we got that. So sin has this power now, and I'm born with this power over me. And what was true of Adam is true of me. And then I placed my faith in Christ and recognized that what Christ did on the cross, he did for me. And I kind of got that. I learned that in Sunday school. And then I'm taken out of Adam and I'm placed into Christ. And what was true of me is no longer true of me. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm kind of like a different person, right? It's like, it's almost like having a different identity. Exactly. But if I'm accustomed to living my life the way I've always lived my life, I could see where maybe simply because I pray a prayer and I'm taken out of Adam and placed in the Christ, I can see where I might have some tendencies to think this way, even though this is true of me, exactly. Paul says this, Paul who gave his life for this, Paul who, it's because of Paul we're here today, because he went and planted churches all around the Mediterranean Rim. He persecuted this Jesus now he says that he is in. He says this, that when Christ died, whether you can get your head around it or not, once you were placed into Christ, his death applies to you. It's as if you died. And the death that he died to sin, he died once for all. It means that you and Christ died to sin. Sin is no longer your master. Sin is no longer your owner. Sin no longer actually controls you unless you say yes to the sin that used to be your master. And so now he comes to the application and I'm gonna read it to you, explain it, and then we're gonna pick it up there next week. Okay, here's here's the application. In the same way, in the same way, count yourselves in the same way that Christ died to sin once for all, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. Now, why would I consider myself dead to sin? Because I'm in Christ and the death that he died, he died to sin. He lived a sinless life and then he allowed death to kill him and then he came back to life. And he said, and you're in me. And just as sin was not his master, sin is not your master. And so he says, just as Christ's death overcame the power of sin and demonstrated the fact that he overcame the power of sin. You are to consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. For sin, this is so awesome. For sin shall no longer, this is verse 14. For sin shall no longer be your master. Now I want us to just practice something. And if you're not a Bible person or a Christian yet, or you don't know, you can just say it out loud, just play along with us, or you can not, and I don't wanna put you on the spot, but. I just want you to hear yourself say something because we're gonna jump into this in a big way next week. I want you to hear yourself say this. Sin is not my master. I just want you to hear yourself say that. Ready, ready? Sin is not my master. Okay. This time I want you to just whisper it, okay? Even if you're watching online or on television, it's okay. Ready, ready? Sin is not my master. Yeah. This time we're gonna whisper it, but I want it just to be barely audible. Ready? You need to tell yourself that a hundred times a day. Because you know what? Sin is not your master. Maybe one way of thinking about it is this, and this is not a perfect illustration. It's a little bit like an international adoption. Many of you have adopted internationally. Most of you know somebody who's adopted internationally. Many of us are related to someone who's adopted internationally. And it's an amazing thing. Because here's a baby, here's a toddler, here's a teenager, a middle school age kid living in another country, living in an orphanage 
with several layers of authority. There's a government, there's a state, there's the institution, there's the orphanage, there's the people in the orphanage. And every single day that child's life is completely dictated by the rules and the laws of both the government and the specific institution and the people in the orphanage. This is when you get up, this is where you go to sleep, this is what you do during the day, this is how many hours of school you get, this is what you do in the afternoon, here's who you are, live with, here's where you're gonna be moved around. Completely dictates that child's life. And then, it's so powerful, it's so emotional if you've been involved, with the stroke of a pen. Now, if you've actually done this, you'd say, Andy, it's a lot more strokes of a lot more pens, but let's just simplify it, okay? It, with the stroke, with ink on a piece of paper, it's a legal transaction. It is a legal transaction. And in some cases, the child doesn't even know it's happening. They're too young to understand. A legal transaction that goes beyond the will of the child, goes beyond the decision-making ability of the child. A legal transaction takes place and something is amazing happens. In a moment, that child goes from orphan to family member. That child goes from, in many cases, many, many cases, no wealth, no thing, no financial future, to by our standards, by international standards, wealth. It goes from a name to another name. I mean, there are so many ramifications and it happens instantly. And the older the child is, as many of you know, the longer it takes for the child to grow accustomed to this new place, this new world, this new family, this new love. It takes so long. And, and you, you know stories, you've heard stories of children who hoard food in their, in their rooms or little kids who cling to Cheerios because in the orphanage there just wasn't enough food. And it takes a long time sometimes for them to wake up to the reality of, I'm not who I used to be. Everything is different now, but... For the sake of our discussion, here's what's most important about an international adoption. With the stroke of a pen, that government, that state, that institution, that orphanage, that person in the orphanage, those staff, as wonderful as they may be, with the stroke of a pen, they lose all authority over that child. And they can write and they can text and they can call. They could even show up at the door. And mom or dad shows up at the door and says, no, you have no authority over this child anymore because they belong to us. Now, here's what Paul's saying. Whether you understood it or not, whether you recognized it or not, whether anybody told you or not, when you were taken out of Adam, and placed into Christ. You got a new name, new identity, new family, new destiny, on and on and on, but maybe most significantly when it comes to your earthly experience. Sin lost its authority over you. And you may be, have been saying yes to sin ever since you became a Christian. You may have been saying yes to sin your entire life because it just welled up in you and it was so strong and you felt like I don't have any choice and you found yourself in this awful battle of I don't want to, but I do want to, but I don't want to. And we're gonna talk about that in the next couple of weeks. But here's what you need to know from this point forward for the rest of your life, whether you ever do anything about it or not. Sin is not your master with the stroke of a pen, it lost all authority over you. And you not only have permission, you have the encouragement of the God who loves you to say to sin, I say, say it out loud, sin is not my master. Sin, you are not my master. Sin is not my master. Mastered. You can call and you can prod and you can make me feel and you can taunt and you can tempt, but you need to know I'm in Christ. And when he died, I died. And the death that he died to the power of sin, I died to the power of sin. And with a stroke of a pen, sin is not my master. Can you imagine living a life like that? Can you imagine this afternoon when there it is again, there he is again, there she is again, there they are again, and all of a sudden in the midst of that, you're like, wait a minute. This is just sin's mechanism of trying to taunt me back into an identity, to a place, to a way of thinking that 
I'm free from. Sin is not my master. Now, so here's what we're going to do this week, because we're just getting started, all right? A little homework assignment. Here's what I want you to do. I want you, if we can go to the next slide, I, I want you to figure out your version of this to begin to whisper. Now, I'm not saying change your behavior. I'm not saying it's time to move out or quit drinking or quit yelling or screaming. I'm not asking you to make any change in your behavior, okay? You may, if you want to, be my, you know, be my guest. All I'm asking you is to recognize something that perhaps you've never recognized before. That in those moments of temptation, in that moment where you're overwhelmed with despair, overwhelmed with loneliness, overwhelmed with lust, overwhelmed with jealousy, overwhelmed with whatever it is, and suddenly you start to go to that place you always go to when you're overwhelmed with those emotions, you can go ahead and go there. All I ask you to do is this. On your way, on your way, would you pause just long enough to whisper out loud, sin is not my master. I'm dead to sin, but I'm alive to God. And then just go ahead and do it. But let me just tell you, when this becomes your new approach to life, when this becomes the new grid through which you view all of life, your marriage, your kids, your habits, the habits you ought to have, your discipline, your body, your health, the way you think, it's going to change things. Because you are not the person you used to be. There's no point in living the way you used to live because sin is not your master. Let's just say it out loud. I want us to whisper it, okay? Ready? Let's say it. Ready? Sin is not my master. Ready? I'm dead to sin. I'm alive to God. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, right now, some of us are thinking, if only, if only, if only. Father, for the person that's leaning so far into this, they're about to fall over. They so desperately want it to be a reality in their life. In this moment, open their eyes to the reality of who you have made them because they are in you. Father, for the person here or listening or watching that this just sounds like a lot of mystical hocus pocus, I get that. Father, would you in the next month or three months or year or three years bring this back to their memory or their minds when they find themselves in that place where we've all been of brokenness, where we feel like we have no choice but to say, God, help me because I can't help myself. Thank you that you're the God that says, I'll take you on that basis. I, I don't mind being a last resort because I'm the God who loves you, sent my son to die for you. But Father, wherever we are and wherever we fall into this and however much of this we understand, just for a week, just for a week, help us to live with the reality, to renew our minds to this truth that sin is not our master. For the death that you died, your son died, he died to sin once for all, once and for all. And we are part of that all. And would you do something so extraordinary in us and through us that we would be the first to say it wasn't a what. It was a who. And the who is Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior, who saved me not from simply from the penalty of sin, but from the power of of sin in the here and now. So Father, please complete what maybe you have begun today and we will be the first to give you the credit for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you so much for being here today. We'll see you next week for part three of Free. Have a great rest of your week.